First John is one of my favorite books of the Bible. You know, if I was told I was going to go be deserted on an island and I had to pick one book of the Bible to take with me, First John is one of those books that's in like the top three. It would be very hard to choose, but this would be one that I would definitely consider being the one book that I could take with me. It's so rich. It's so full. And there's just so much in it that is helpful for us believers for today. It's so relevant for today. But I want to go over a passage in 1 John chapter 3, specifically verses 4 through 10, that are somewhat problematic for some people. And I believe there's a lot of misunderstanding a lot around them, specifically verse 6 that says, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. And we're going to look at this more in detail in just a moment. But recently, I've been putting out videos on a couple of different subjects where I have been referencing this scripture passage, and I kind of glaze over it and just hit the highlights of it, but I haven't really jumped into it with you, and that's what I want to do here in this video today. We were talking before about, you know, demons in relations to Christians and how demonization differs between believers and non-believers and spiritual warfare and demonic strongholds versus indwelling demons. We've done a lot, pretty deep study on a lot of that stuff. So there's a lot of videos about that, but I reference 1 John chapter 3 and chapter 5 a lot in those uh, videos as well. So I want to mention it here. And then also I put out a video recently about uh, Christians beware of the rise in deception around the Donald Trump assassination attempt and all of that. I put out a video about false prophets and false teachers and false prophecy. And I also reference this passage as well, talking about being aware of the rising deception. And John is talking and writing to them about false teachers, false prophets, and rising deception. So this is very relevant. And I want to go through 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 through 10 with you now. And let's take a look at this and understand that to be a Christian does not mean that you're never going to sin again. There have been entire doctrines created out of this called sinless perfection that people uh, say that you can be sanctified fully and perfected here on earth in this human uh, fleshly fallen body. Uh, it's not possible. Scripture makes it uh, incredibly clear that's not possible. Um, so let's read this and, and get an understanding of what this actually means and what John is actually saying here. So I'm going to switch out of paragraph mode here real quick to verse mode in Blue Letter Bible here, which is my favorite online Bible site, by the way. Um, Nobody's asking me to say that. I'm just telling you because it's incredibly helpful and useful if you use the Bible online. But let's read 1 John 3, 4 through 10. He says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin, talking about Jesus. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Okay, so there's a lot there that we need to go over. But starting in verse 4, he defines what sin is. Sin is lawlessness. I always think of Matthew 7, 21 through 23, when they said, Did we not prophesy in your name? Do many mighty works in your name, cast out demons in your name. And he says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's what Jesus says. So here that's defined. You're a worker of sin. Um, I did not know you is what he says. So lawlessness is sin. He defines that for us, lets us know that Jesus uh, appeared in order to take away sins. And in Jesus, there is no sin. He was perfect, right? So I think those are pretty self-explanatory. But getting to verse six, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Now, I've explained before in the past, just to cut to the chase, what John is talking about here is a lifestyle of sin or habitual sin. How do we know this? If we go back 
It is very helpful if you read 1 John just kind of all the way through. Put it in paragraph mode, or if you're reading a paper Bible, just read. They're, they're five chapters, but they're very short chapters, and just read it all the way through. And if you read 1 John 1 and 1 John 2 leading up to these scriptures, which we're about to skim over real quick, you'll understand a whole lot more clearly what he's trying to say and who he's talking to here. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Now, off the rip, it sounds like he's saying that if you sin ever at all, you're not a Christian and you've never seen God, you've never known God, and you're still out in the left field and you're lost and you need to find Jesus. And when you find Jesus, you're never going to sin again. That's how it can read to a lot of people. And some people take it to that place erroneously. But let's look at 1 John 1. There's another famous passage here. Uh, 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say we have not s- If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay, so is John contradicting himself there? No, he's not. Look at the first verse of the next chapter. My little children, 1 John chapter 2, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. So, going back to our passage here, is he saying that you're never going to sin again? No. So John is not teaching sinless perfection. He is not saying that if you're in Christ, you've now become perfect. You're never going to mess up. You're never going to miss the mark. You're going to you know, lose your temper. You're never going to uh, do anything wrong ever again. Y'all, I have some errands to run later, and it's about 30 miles away, and it's on this road that I have to drive in my town that's only a two-lane road, and it's really frustrating because people drive really slow, and I suffer from road rage. Just going to admit it openly. I I get frustrated when people drive 10, 15 mile an hour below the speed limit, which happens a lot here because I live in a coastal town in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, or people cut me off or I'm I'm just like my father in the sense that I got to get to where I'm going and I want to go. Okay. So sometimes I say things and think things and I'm just like, Lord, forgive me. And my flesh rises up and I just suffer from road rage sometimes. And every now and then I'll just blurt something out and I'm like, oh gosh, that was ugly. Where did that come from? So I, in that moment of sin where I'm, you know, f- fussing at somebody and it doesn't matter if it's a cuss word or not. I'm, I'm just saying when we went over that whole thing where Jesus says, if you call your brother, you fool is in danger of the fire of hell. And you fool is the word raka, which is actually a tone of voice or speaking to somebody with contempt. So whether you say a cuss word or not, it's it's the attitude behind what you're saying that matters. It's the heart posture that matters, right? So even if I say you big dummy or you idiot or whatever word I use, I'm just as guilty of sin in that moment as if I cuss somebody out. So uh, these things happen. And when I do that, does that mean I'm not actually saved? Does that mean that I don't, I, I have never seen God or I don't know God? No, that's not what that means at all. Our salvation is not that fickle and we're not just wavering back and forth. Oh, I'm not saved in that moment, but when I'm reading my Bible and when I'm making these videos and when I'm praying, oh, I'm saved in this moment, that's that's not at all how it works. He's talking about ceasing from a habitual lifestyle of sin. One example of this, and and the reason why we know that real quick is because if you look at the Greek, the Greek tenses of words matter, and they don't always translate properly over into English. If we look at different um, Bible comparisons here, uh, the different versions. So if you look at the King James and King James Version, it says he does not sin. Um, This one says will not sin. Uh, If you look at the RSV, it says no one who abides in him sins. Um, But the ESV, they've come and and tried to um, add that tense of the word in the English translation so that we better understand what they're saying. And that's why it says keeps on sinning. The NIV does the same thing, keeps on sinning, which is a more accurate uh, representation of what John is writing here. And I just believe I showed you that by showing you 1 John 1 and 1 John 2, where he says, yeah, we're going to sin, we're going to mess up, but we have an advocate in Jesus Christ, the righteous, okay? So sinless perfection is not what he is preaching here, and we're all going to make 
make mistakes. We're all going to do things. We're all going to say things. We're all going to, uh, uh, things are going to happen. And we're like, whoa, where did that come from? Um, and that is our fleshly our sinful nature. Look at First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Now, here is Peter saying that this person is now perfect. No, he's he's delivering the same idea as John here in 1 John 3, 6. So he's given this idea that when we've uh, submitted ourselves to Jesus, when we've come to know Christ, we cease from a lifestyle of habitual sin. Let's give some examples around that. I've heard testimonies of people who, you know, were in college and they had a radical encounter with the Lord. They got saved. They encountered Jesus. And then they were going to college parties and drinking and partying and doing all that. And they would try to go back and do the same thing they were doing and just live their life the same way they were before. But suddenly they couldn't do it. There was something bothering them. They were noticing everything around them and feeling dirty and feeling awkward and awful and this isn't right and something's wrong here. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit now living in your heart. That's what he's talking about here. When you get saved and you actually get saved and encounter Jesus, something changes. It brings about transformation. Now, here's the error I think a lot of people make is they sometimes it happens miraculously and there's instantaneous things that you're delivered from and free from and that you don't go back to. But other things, there's a process called sanctification, right? Sometimes it happens more rapidly than others. We have been sanctified when we're saved, but we're being sanctified today and we're going to be sanctified in the future as long as we're alive until we are perfected and with Jesus again. So, So we're in this process and we're in this journey. There's things that are okay with you maybe today that might not be okay with you in a year's time that the Lord might begin to draw you away from and that your conviction in that area may increase, okay? That's absolutely possible. It's happened to me over my life. I know a lot of people that that's true for. Some of it's instantaneous and some of it it is a process. So I want to encourage some of you out there to have some grace for yourself. You're not going to wake up and be perfect just because you're a Christian now, but our God is patient. He is gentle and he's walking with you. And he's going to, over time, ask you to give things over to him eventually. Maybe he's not asking you right now, today, but like I said, in a year or two years or three years time, he might say, hey, are you going to give me that? And you're going to surrender it to the Lord out of love for him, not out of obligation, not out of legalism, not out of cultural Christianity, and because you're trying to look the part, but you're going to notice that the Holy Spirit will start to move on your life and transform you by the renewing of your mind. He's going to start transforming your heart and your life to where you start giving him these carnal things that are no longer as important as following him, as pleasing him, as knowing that he is watching you, that you're abiding in him and he in you, and that what you're doing is pleasing unto the Lord because you love him and you want to know him and you want him to know you. And this is what we call sanctification. And this is what's happening over time. So have grace for yourself and understand that the Holy Spirit is leading this. And this is not something that we're doing on our own accord to earn our righteousness. So what John is trying to tell us here is that we've abandoned our old lifestyle and we've, we're focused on Jesus, we're pursuing Jesus, and it's in this place of abiding in Him abiding in Christ, Christ abiding in us. John chapter 15, he wrote about that, right? He is the vine, we are the branches, and we abide in Jesus Christ. He talks about in um, chapter 2, verse 3 through 6 here, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. Hallelujah. It reminds me of John chapter 8 when he says, Truly you are my disciples if you abide in my word, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you 
free, John 8, 31 and 32. So you see how all these things start to work together and they start to support uh, one another. He's not talking about sinless perfection here, but abiding and keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Like David wrote, meditating on his word, on his law, day and night. Read your Bible in the morning, pray in the morning. Let it be the first thing you do when you wake up and put that in your heart, put that in your mind and read that and get it in your head and dwell on that throughout the day. Do it on your lunch break. Just abide in Jesus Christ and fill your mind with that. That is how we walk in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, Galatians chapter 5, okay? Now, why is John telling them this right here? Why does he go on and start talking about this? Verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. What is he talking about? Let no one deceive you. Well, let's go back to chapter 2 and look at the context here of what he's talking about. Warning concerning Antichrist right here, 18 and 19, uh, really 18 through 26 gives us the context for what John is talking about with this deception. Children, it's the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrist has come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Now, if they thought they were in the last hour, what are we in today? <laughs> they went out from us, but they were not of us. For they, if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. Who is he talking about? He is talking about false teachers. False teachers and false prophets. We get more to that, into that in 1 John chapter 4 when he's telling us to test the spirits. Not every spirit is of God. I'm telling you, this whole book is rich, y'all. And if you want to go through it chapter by chapter, let me know in the comments and maybe we can do that because I know we're getting short on time here. But he's telling us, uh, he's telling us that there's false teachers that have gone out. Let's skip into verse 26. I write you, oops, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Okay. So this is the context of 1 John 3, 7, when he's talking about there's been false teachers going out. What are they teaching? I don't know, but it has something to do uh, about the divinity of Christ, more than likely. If you read through this, you kind of gather that maybe they're saying Jesus isn't the Christ, or he's not of God, or maybe he was just a good teacher or a good prophet. Does that sound familiar? Um, something along those lines. But now he's coming back in this section, and he's telling us, this is who you know is actually of God. John chapter 8. You are of your father, the devil. Why? Because you keep sinning. Isn't that what he says right here? So don't let anybody deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is actually righteous as Jesus is righteous. Just like he said in John chapter 2. Right here, by this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk the same way in which he walked. So when we imitate Christ, when we're walking like Christ walked, those are the ones that are actually of Christ. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we're never going to miss the mark. It doesn't mean we're not going to get road rage sometimes or something's going to slip out of our mouth or we're going to do something we're ashamed of and have to repent, have to ask for forgiveness. He makes it clear that's what we're going to have to do sometimes. But we're not making a practice of sinning for that person is of the devil. John is warning about people who are going to come in the name of God, come in the name of Jesus and say, yes, I know him. Yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I'm a believer just like you are, but this, the fruit of their life is going to be something completely different. They're going to teach a different gospel. They're going to preach a different gospel. The fruit of their life is going to be sinful. It's going to be sensual. It's going to be misleading, and they're going to try to mislead others with their false gospel. Again, he reiterates this here in verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abide in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. And this is the point of this passage. He is showing us who are the children of God. And who is the children of the devil? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now, this is going to sound out of place to some people, but remember the two greatest commandments, love God, love each other. In another passage here, which we'll go over at another time, he says that the one who says, I love God, but he hates his brother, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. And my friend, we see that all the time. People treating one another like garbage in the name of God. 
saying, I love God. Oh my gosh, he's, he's my everything. But then they're so rude to their brother and sister in Christ. Then they gossip, slander, tear down their brother and sister in Christ. They manipulate, they control people. They do all of these other things. The fruit of their life says everything but I love God. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus said, before you bring your gift to the altar, if you remember that your brother has something against you, go and make that right. What is he saying there? He cares about these horizontal relationships that we can't say, oh, I'm going to offer my sacrifice. I'm going to do my holy worship. I'm going to enter into worship. I'm going to do my religious practice and just forsake my fellow man and treat people like garbage. No, we can't do that. He cares that we are right with each other. Now, uh, there's some nuance there, obviously, but we are to love one another. And sometimes that requires speaking the truth in love and telling people the truth. But what John is trying to tell us right here is these are the ones that are of God and these are the ones that are not. John chapter 8, he talks about this a lot as well. So I hope this makes sense. We can dig more into uh, 1 John if y'all would like. Like I said, let me know in the comments section if you would enjoy that and get more into the Greek and the Greek tenses of these words so that we can better look at this. And I can visually show you this on the screen that this is actually what he is saying. Um, You know, I had mentioned as as my proof text for Christians not having indwelling demons and all that 1 John chapter 5 verse 18. And, you know, this is why I came back to it. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. So this helps us understand we're not wavering from salvation, not to being saved every time we sin. No, that's not what it means. But he's describing those who are abiding in Jesus, those who are pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ, those who are in him, he is in us. I am I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. We're a new creation believers in Jesus Christ. That's why I say this passage um, belongs to and is true for everyone who is in Christ. This isn't if I get road rage, I'm going to get a demon, you know, because in that moment I sin. People try to take that and twist that scripture up and it's simply not what it means. So I hope you understand more clearly what John is saying here. Peter says the same thing. Paul says similar things as well that we cease from sin. We're putting that old life behind us and we're turning and walking in the new man and the Holy Spirit. The spirit of truth will lead us into all truth. So I hope this helped. I hope this made sense. If you like this style of video more, where I'm just kind of going through the scriptures and showing you how I read them and how I study them. Uh, if that's helpful to you, let me know below or if there's a specific passage you would like to look at or know more about, let me know. Uh, I think what I'm going to do on my Patreon page is start going through 1 John, you know, chapter by chapter. I'm going to do it there regardless if I do it on YouTube or not. So if you're not a member of our Patreon and you're interested in that and you want to support us monthly, you can do that there. I'll put the link below in the description so you can do that. It's free to join. The content is available to everyone. But if you do want to contribute monthly, that option is available. Or if you wanted to give a one-time donation or contribution to the channel. You can do that in the links below as well. But I certainly appreciate y'all being here. I'm going to do this nonetheless. Uh, Donations are never required, but always appreciated. And I just uh, love doing this, love having the ability and opportunity to do this. And I just ask that y'all would pray for me. I'll be praying for you. But if you're not subscribed, I would certainly appreciate it and ask you to hit that like button. That's the thumbs up button. And that tells YouTube to send this video out to more people. But anyway, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.